I, I like, sorry, I can't remember who one of you, one of you, and I think it's one of the four of you said you really love these, uh, these documents in this book because it is bringing you stuff that you don't normally get in history class. And then, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that's true. Um, what I worry a little bit about in this, in this section, in this week, is that there's, there's, a, there's a possible conflation or a possible uh, uh, there's a possibility of thinking that all progressive ideas and all progressive movements and all progressive organizations are pressuring the government for the same thing and they're pressuring the government in the, in the same ways. And that, um, that really didn't happen that way. So I, even though I didn't, I didn't write the questions out this way, I should have in that uh, uh, a lot of these, a lot of these, the reason why these are, these have different questions and different people bringing in, I mean, Brandeis and Smith and Rosebud and, and everything is because that progressivism isn't, isn't as you know, as you know, it's just not this one thing and not all being hammered into, um, hammered into the government uh, 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 as one group or one set of demands, um, which is sometimes happens in other, in other uh, reform movements, although usually there is, a, there is a pretty big diversity between, <coughs> sorry, hang on. between what happens and, and what, uh, uh, sorry, what the demands are and how those demands are, 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 uh, are, are pressured and are, are put towards various governments. Um, so is anyone here from question one? Jeanette, you're here from question one. Yes. I'm gonna open the chat just in case. Well, what, uh, what reasons did the Supreme Court give for agreeing to limits being placed on working out from the um, it wasn't really due to like a workers' rights type of situation. It was more of, I mean, it was a sexist ideology that women weren't physically fit enough to take in that many hours of work. Mm -hmm. And that it was also like necessary for the state to protect a woman's body due to the fact that she is a mother. Mm -hmm. um, and those were the two biggest issues. Uh, why do you think that's the case? Why do you think that that there continues to be? It's funny because we just happen to be talking about this in, in the morning class, which is a different class, obviously. And we're talking about women's reform, and and, and there is this there is this continual notion that women have this separate and in some cases, a uh, uh, um, higher level or more, higher moral plane because of their, of their biology, you know, that, that the, that the, um, that the morality of humankind flows through the woman, the, the female line, because women are mothers and, and all kinds of stuff. And um, this seems to, to come up uh, in almost every, sorry, every women's reform movement, um, throughout the 19th century uh, and even is brought up again in the, in the anti ERA movement in the 1970s. Uh, uh, people saying Phyllis Shafley saying that the equal rights amendment was, is, is a way to destroy motherhood. Um, you know, well, when I, had a, I had a point behind this question. Um, uh, and so, so even suffragists who we were talking about partly in, in this period, uh, are um, uh, as are even women's rights campaigners sometimes argue that women should not have the vote because that would corrupt them. You know that getting involved in politics is a man's thing because it's a dirty business. Um, so I'm just running up. 
why do you think that why do you think that is why do you, it seems like there's this massive diversity of of ideas about what what women are and what what roles they have to play and how that should be reflected in government. I'm just looking at the document while I talk about this. Yeah, well, I mean, like, it's pretty proven that we just live in a patriarchal society. Like, it's ingrained into our society and how mm -hmm. we... So I think it was an easy footing to use those ideals to like a woman's advantage and be like okay well we can't get them to believe in workers rights because it is the right of a worker to not work that much for such little pay but we can use this idea of sex and this patriarchal view of women to get that but i think and i think we still do that now with mm -hmm. a lot um but it kind of ends up shooting women in the foot later. Uh, there's a there's a uh, there's an interesting line here the first first line uh, first line in the one two three fourth paragraph differentiated by these matters from the other sex she is property woman is properly placed in a class by herself and legislation designed for her protection must be sustained. There's nothing in this about the women's work as a liberating thing, is there? No, it's all about, it's almost like treating women as children. Yeah. And I also, so, wonder, sorry, I, don't, go ahead. I don't know enough about like what led into this, but it also, it feels like the arguments that, like, it's like this sort of, like the argument of, I hear from a lot of pro-life people is almost like, this is a way more radicalized view of that. But I feel like, you know, a lot of pro-choice people argue that women are not property and it is not the state's right to control if a woman, if a woman has the ability to like give birth and if she is giving mm -hmm. birth, this feels like where that almost began because they're protecting women because they have to be mothers. That was just me kind of thinking. Yeah, the, and the, again, the, pre, with the previous paragraph, this is especially true when the burdens of motherhood are produced, are, are, are upon her. Um, now, is, is, is this surprising at all though? That, I mean, after all, this is 1908. This is over a hundred years ago. This isn't exactly the time when you, you know i don't even think that i don't even think the term liberation was used for women in in the way that it was used for enslaved peoples for instance or the way it was used uh for women's lib in the 1970s i mean what i'm wondering is this is if um the, the way the way exactly the way you're saying the uh, Jeanette the, exactly the way they're saying this is couched is fitting with the times. It's not a, it's not necessarily uh, an 1808 sentiment. It's very much a 1908 sentiment. This uh, this is still very powerful. Yeah. It again, um, like. Yeah, there is no like a woman is a human equal to a man in this. It's she's a child. Mm -hmm. so protect her. And yeah, I don't know how much of a win, win this was for <laughs> women's rights. Well, uh, uh, um, I don't I don't think it was much. And I think I think one of the reasons it sits in this book is because it is showing that there, there's this, there's the, the very different, the very different definition of what rights are considered at this at this uh, Supreme Court level, uh, what women's rights are considered to be at the Supreme Court level, as opposed to other rights. Yeah, like, yeah, I just that's what uh, 
I, I think it was like in, I don't know which book it was in, but there was another, another text that wrote about this. And I think it talked about like the reaction Jane Addams had and that she was being very positive about it, but didn't have high hopes because she also thought it would close the door for men getting um, like limited working hours. Right. Well, and this says that it says, uh, um, uh, even when the like legislation is not necessary for men, it could not be sustained. That's, that's in the same, uh, of that fourth paragraph that I was, that I was talking about. Uh, okay, what about uh, question two here? Is this, Lindsay, this is you. Yes. Why is Al, Al Smith is ex an extremely interesting person. Uh, right. Very complicated. Um, sorry, I had to get my book out. Um, so during this, he basically said that um, they didn't want him, they didn't want women to work nighttime, which I thought was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and that the other state should have power to say that they shouldn't work, they shouldn't be worked at the salary because it's less sufficient and also health and comfort. And then I also noticed that um, there's, women went like their argument was basically like women should not go to work or a young girl with the intention of like working there like they want to like up themselves into the world like they just don't want to be working in like department stores or like oh wait you know like factories or any like factories or like shirt waist manufacturers mm -hmm. be able to start a life or maybe even have a family or go to school so they wanted to imply that wage to also make it livable so they could have that life and have that chance of making a living and being able to have that power to make something more than just working in a store their whole life um also but one of the arguments was that minimum wage interferes with bargaining and also the rights of the people and that's why they did salary instead because they didn't think it was fair like one person get paid let's say four dollars an hour but someone else may get paid two dollars an hour so they thought having that salary would make it more fair for everyone but um there was also i thought this was really interesting that the wage board stated you may make any bargain you will with your employer you may make any arrangement as to salary which you please among your classes but in interest of the state and of society you cannot pay less than this amount to a girl of this age in the part of the state. So their argument was basically saying you can't have a 10 year old making that much money. Like it's unacceptable, but then it's like, well, what are you going to pay them then? Mm -hmm. Salary is unacceptable. Then what are you going to pay them? $2 because at this time too, like a lot of these girls weren't even in school because they had to go to work. They yeah. weren't like, they had to drop out because they had to help their family or help their younger siblings while mom and dad were at work. Like they had to work because they had to make money because their parents were making money. So they also had to step up. So which I thought was, I mean, in a way, then what are you going to pay them then? Like, that's what I, you know, like that would be my argument. So what are you going to pay them? If you're saying they're too young to make a salary, then what are you going to do? Pay them $2. That's not going to be livable like mm -hmm. $2 today. But, um, another, there was like another side too, that health, they also were worried about health and they right. weren't clothed in time. Like they weren't clothed properly. And, but then the state refused to give them health care. So there was really, at this point, what was right or wrong, because no matter what they did, there was unfairness. No matter what someone decided, there was still unfairness in this situation. Yeah, well, I think, I certainly think that's absolutely true. And notice how now it's so, Al, Al Smith is so, Al Smith is seen as this 
tremendous uh, reformer and tremendous forward thinker, but he's still talking about things as, uh, um, for instance, in the on second paragraph on 412, um, she goes there, she goes into work, the department store or shirt, waist, shirt factory or whatever, for a start in life. Her ultimate desire is the desire of all women that she have her own home and her own family. Well, everyone seems to that that part the ultimate desire part seems to be a, a given that uh, you know al smith says this and no one and well I, I happen to know that no one stands up and says well wait a minute <laughs> i want to be a career woman or what what about career women that that phrase didn't even really uh exist in it in this period so it's interesting how how so much of these arguments have to be built around what everybody accepts to be the minimal or the obvious thing that that people or uh, women or children or even men uh, have to have to have as goals in their lives. But like also like another argument like in general is like, well, maybe men didn't want to work either. Mm -hmm. You know, like now like it's became a thing that there are stay at home men because women want to work rather work than men. So mm -hmm. like maybe not all these women at the time wanted, maybe that desire wasn't for them to have a family. Like you said, maybe they wanted to have a career. So at this point, what was right or wrong? Because it's like, no one knew really how to stand up or like what to think, because in that time, women had like, it was the responsibility, like women had to stay home and have a family and clean and cook and do everything. And the men provided, mm -hmm. but who's to say like, these women didn't want to work. Like you said, well, I, I, I think, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Like, what if they didn't want to have a family? But like, you know what I mean? But that wasn't normal at that time. Well, yes, I think, and I think one of the, one of the things that the, the, the expansion of women's history is starting to show us is the, and starting to show us, has been showing us for 20 years, is the diversity of opinion. You know, there are plenty of women who want to, who do want to go do want to do this start in an office or or, or factory uh, factory and then but then ultimately uh um be mothers and in fact i know as late as as the uh as the 50s and 60s there maybe even the 70s there were there was this idea that you know your young daughters went off to manhattan to work in an office uh to cat to get a man and to um uh uh, as, as soon as they, as soon as they got one of the, the, uh, as soon as they attracted the eye of their boss or middle level manager, they'd get married and they'd move, move back home, back home and start a family. Now it turns out that didn't happen. One of the most interesting articles I've ever read in history, someone actually delved into this uh, granted, I'm talking way outside our period here, but I, don't, I was thought it was interesting, uh, because in my family, there was, the, there was always this notion that aunt ginger went into the city to to work at an office, but really to, to, to find a husband. Well, it turns out that, that almost, almost all those women who did that ended up marrying men from their neighbor, their own, their own neighborhood at home anyway. So that, so this, so, so that didn't happen. Um, uh, but also there's this idea in this period, I, don't, I actually don't know how that relates, what I would just said relates to what we're talking about, but anyway, there is an idea in this period that there are careers for women, but they're definitely prescribed. You know, there are teachers, um, uh, there are uh, social workers to a certain degree. And we always forget, even because it's a small percentage of women, if, if you want to have a career as a woman, you become a nun. Yeah. You know, that's a career and, and you are giving up your family, but that's the only, that's one of the few cases among the majority opinion that, that that's acceptable to, to uh, move outside of the family track. If you come in, if you come in on that's okay. But if you wanted to become a, a, a marketing manager and be, and be, not start a family that that's considered uh, unusual. Um, and by the way, there, there are a lot, there are, uh, I encourage any of you who are interested that, that, that this this sort of thing is very has been very heavily studied for a while now because it turns out that lots of people 
in the 19th century, uh, yes, Katie, a lot of teachers couldn't be married at this time. And they got married. They had to, they had to, they had to leave. Certainly if they had children, they had to, but, but in, in an awful lot of rural places, for instance, teachers, there was, there was no ban on, on getting married and having children because they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, there simply wasn't enough supply of teachers so that, so they could, um, uh, so some teachers for some schools in some places could be, could be married. So it's not universal. Um, what was I saying before that? Uh, oh, crap. Hang on one second. Um, I forgot what this, the, the, the thought I had before I answered Katie's question about, about women, uh, about uh, marriage, marriage and uh, uh, well, anyway, sorry, it's, it's gone now. Lindsay, what else do you want to say about this? Um. I just thought it was like really interesting how he put it like into perspective. I mean, at first it was kind of confusing. I had to read it like multiple times because he was kind of like all over the place. Um, yeah, because it is a speech. It's a, you know, he's just yeah. sort of. Um, I thought it was also like interesting that he discussed how like the state justified to protecting the underpaid woman workers and minors in the interest of the state and society. Right. Why in the interest of the state and the society? What about the women and children? What about them? Why didn't their voice matter? Who, like, that, it's, like, crazy to me that, like, they were deciding that much without taking, in, like, into consideration of what, how they feel or what they want. They were just putting, like, at this time, women still didn't have enough respect. They mm -hmm. were being treated, like, nothing still. Like, after, even though, like, a lot has changed up until this point, like, they were still not being respected like they should have or deserved, especially with them not being paid a salary. Oh, oh the, the, the idea of a woman as an individual agent in her own life is, that's a fairly recent thing. That's definitely a post-World War II thing. There's all this talk about how women, women as a group have to fit into society and society's flow of things. Whereas the, there's this longstanding celebration of the man as an individual going off and, you know, fighting wars and, 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 and going out West and, and uh, you know, discovering things. This is all kinds of celebration of that. And, and that's, not, that's not an improper thing for men to do, but it would be improper for, for um for women to do okay let's see who else let's see question three uh no one's here for question three did did you did any of you read these read these things and have thoughts about them though i'm sort of assuming since you're the the cream of the crop you probably got interested in this stuff Lindsay, is that you lighting up? You're about to say something or what? Oh, no. Was okay. I like, oh, I didn't know. I was looking at the question. Like I went back to like review the question three. Just... Document question three. It turns out to be document three. Yeah. And, and this time, well, what I've always been, so just, just to say a few things that, that I have always been struck by this, uh, by this and also by La Follette air reforms and La Follette, um, uh, demands or La Follette's sort of agenda is, is what I call agenda mongering. It's the very big into lists. There need to be these lists of things done. Blah, 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 blah. And a, a huge long list of things. And it's, it's almost as if rather than saying we need to have freedom and liberation and equality for all, period, that go, goes on and lists reforms. And once we have freedom and liberation and equality for all, then everything will be 
we'll be better from that point about and we don't have to uh uh there's a, there's a thing where he's like you know he goes to some even to the detail of saying we have to outlaw spitting in this and i've forgotten where 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 this is uh but the the whole of fallout i did the whole of fallout project seems to be we can we can uh we can reform all these things but we need to make we need a detailed list and plans of action and uh that's a very progressive era approach to things very very progressive era approach to things you know i see all of these the, the, if you if you read through this list there's a there's all kinds of detail here that that um, seems to be uh, maybe not nitpicking, but overly meddling in what people are are, are uh, uh, how people are behaving. Anyway, uh, question uh, four, Katie, you're here. Yep, <clears throat> that's me. Um... <laughs> So when I started looking at this, I had read through it a couple of times <clears throat> and then I got really curious about like some of the, the, the outside information. Like mm -hmm. I wanted to know where exactly this was. I know he said Kansas, but I was curious. So I looked it up and, and then I realized that throughout this whole um, speech that he gives, mm -hmm. uh, Theodore Roosevelt, gives he refers to the civil war six times um and makes references uh, like overt references at least three other oh i think i counted those all together sorry my notes are a little haphazard um so it's it blatantly refers to the civil war at least six times mm -hmm. and it was 45 years before this yeah like, as reading through this like when I put that in perspective like the things that he's saying specifically are at least a generation and a half if not two generations previous so it made me wonder who was the intended audience of this speech just mostly because of the wording like being in Kansas which was historically a rather split state like it was certainly mm -hmm. not um in the union, even parts of it that were, I mean, there's, it, it wasn't a. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't called bleeding Kansas for no reason in the 1850s. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I just thought it was interesting that it's been 45 years and he's still going through um, anyway, but he talked, that was just something that in reading it, I was curious about. Yeah. Um, but so you're right. I now, I, now that I, now that I look at it, it is, it is almost, and certainly four times he mentions the Civil War directly. directly Sorry, go ahead. And then uh, inadvertently, or maybe not inadvertently, but like uh, he talks about uh, begrudging Grant, Sherman, yeah. Sheridan, uh, these people. And then later on, he talks about um, the Grand Army. And so, I mean, it's, it's multiple times. And so I did, it did make me curious what the intended audience was for this because he clearly has a perspective um, that skews it so that it is received in a very particular way. Anyway, uh -huh. that was just something I noticed. But um, it, there's a line, sorry, I'm trying to find it. I, I'm used to highlighting in all of my books, but because I rented everything, I'm trying not to highlight and it makes me a little crazy. Um, <laughs> Oh, he says, uh, after the word Kansas, he starts on this thing where he says, I want the square deal for the poor yeah. man. And I do not mean I want the square deal for the man who remains poor because he's not got the good energy to work for himself. So for the rest of this, he talks about like what his justification is, um, you know, against special interest. And it's, it's essentially like, not that special interest shouldn't exist. Like, yes, these people have an interest and we should value their opinion, but maybe not give them spots in Congress and not let them control things. Mm -hmm. um, which I think to the audience he was speaking at is an interesting perspective because these were 
I mean, Kansas has never been a particularly rich state. Um, and so it's interesting that he's speaking out against, uh, I think he says specifically, uh, cotton and slavery uh, mm -hmm. that threaten our political integrity before the Civil War. So now the special great business interest too is often control. So it's because he's speaking in Kansas and he chose those specific things. Cotton was not really grown in Kansas. That's really seen as a deep South, mm -hmm. um, at least to my knowledge. No, and, no, you're right. You're right. And, and um, you know, they have a very different, um, I guess, farming technique. So I think it was an interesting choice that he chose cotton and slavery because those are things that are very divisively like deep South. Uh -huh. And so in a way, he's still pandering to these people without calling them out and saying, you know, you guys fought on the wrong, on the losing side of this war that happened two generations ago. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, but I, 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 um, when you when you say you don't know or you were questioning what the what the audience is, I'm pretty sure I, I, I pretty sure I'm not wouldn't with 100 percent. I've always thought that this was the case. This comes from a speech given to the Grand Army of the Republic. Do you know what the GAR is? The Grand Army of the Republic. Uh, Does anybody know? As I'm going through the list, I'm trying to figure out. I don't know that acronym no it, it is uh, it, it was a uh uh what do you call it nowadays um well it was a, a veterans group for union soldiers after the war oh. um, and um uh the, in fact fink should have said that in his introduction to this um and so that's why uh that's probably why roosevelt yeah. doing all this grant sherman stuff and also saying the 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 uh, corrupt business is the same is, is morally morally corrupt business is the same as morally corrupt slave owning. Yeah, because that puts a different a totally different perspective. And I should have looked it up uh, what the Grand Army was because that really does change um, the the kind of context of this. Because if he's speaking to people who are already leaning more towards the side. Um, that he clearly is, is shooting for here. Yeah, that would definitely be a, a shot to say big business, the, these special interests are essentially the same as what we fought against in the war. And that would make these people definitely uh, more, far more open to listen to what he's saying here. So, you know, he's essentially he's saying we need to listen to these companies but not give them a voice on the major platform um to not let them have oh thank you uh to not let them be um they're not entitled to a vote in congress a voice on the bench or the representation of public office and um so i thought i thought that that was a really interesting it's funny, knowing now that that's Union soldiers, it changes kind of the direction that I read this. And so I think reading it a different, another time with that perspective would make me see it differently. Does that make sense? Yeah, but, but I, I mean, it's interesting because I think I think that uh, Roosevelt is, 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 and the title of this is The New Nationalism. He's, he's, he's tying this idea of fighting corrupt business as being, that's the patriotic thing to do. Right. Not, he doesn't argue, unless I'm wrong here, he doesn't argue, doesn't make economic arguments about this, doesn't say monopolies no, no, no. and trusts are bad because they the economically competition, blah, 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 blah. He's talking about justice and, and, the, and he doesn't say the American way, but he basically does. And it's the same thing. It's, it's a parallel problem uh, it's, it's a problem that is similar in form to the to the problem of slavery and the and the moral corruption of slavery. The Did Grand you know, Army of the Republic, by the way, is extre an extremely interesting organization. Uh, I thought it was still going, but I think I think uh, I don't think it is, and maybe it. 
uh, yeah, here I look, just look at the way, page, way 1856 dissolved. Um, they had all kinds of this is sort of I can't remember which uh, 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 well, that's, I, I do know this. One of the reasons why the sons of Confederate veterans and the daughters of the Confederacy, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, UDC and C. SCV, two very important organizations, are formed is be, partly because the Grand Army is, is so successful in this movement, and the, and the Southern Confederate veterans and, and the UDC are uh, are uh, are formed later in the century. They're also formed to promote Jim Crow, but that's that's another story. Um, and so these GAR meetings would happen. There'd be an annual convention. There would be usually at Gettysburg or someplace like that. Um, it was really a big, a big thing. And and the uh, oh, the American Legion. That's the that's the group. I'm, you know, there are a number of veterans organizations in in the country, but um, this one was really sort of the the first one that had had a, had an outreach and a public uh, uh, persona of its own to to move forward. So. I think what I meant, maybe it got lost in my jabbering, was that if he was speaking to a group of people who maybe were looking at this from a different perspective, had they been Confederates, this would have been a much more um, aggressive speech. Like he's he's very clear in his words and it's he's very careful to not um, say anything derogatory explicitly, but what he talks, because he goes over and over and says to be fair, to be complete, and and we don't mm. want any mob violence. And so as it, with it being a well-receiving audience, then this is really just an up, not uplifting, but this is just pushing forward what they already stand for. And these people, these men are at least in their 60s, right? Because if they were 18. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is 45 years later. So he, well, except that in the Grand Army, your, your, your sons are able to keep uh, are able to be membership. It's sort of a, it's not just a veterans organization, sort of like uh, to keep the memory alive thing as well. Because okay. certainly the sons of Confederate veterans, obviously not Confederate veterans, it's sons right. of. Uh, and uh, so that, and, and GAR halls, uh, they used to be all over the place. Uh, obviously not there around anymore, but the, I think in some towns particularly like lancaster and places like that you can see old buildings says gar hall or gar 1892 and that's when the, the building in lancaster was dedicated to I'm, I'm just making that up but but it's that type of type of thing fraternal organization i think that's one of those things that growing up in the south uh i that's not a term i've ever heard because we have plenty of uh like confederate things but i've the grand army is probably not something that we would have been taught in school uh well you know it it it, it, it sort of fall fell out of uh uh interest in in because it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't go on then to promote it's not like modern the scv and the udc are definitely these these racist organizations that definitely want to do this one thing, Jim Crow. So they, so they're, they're very become very strong and they, they survive the GAR. I mean, Roosevelt, and a bunch of people try to get them involved in a lot of things and they do get involved, in but it's just not, you know, they won. So, the, you know, it's just not as uh, there's not just as a, a larger motivating uh, factor. I mean, the, the, if, if sorry, going off topic here, but if you take the American Legion as an example, uh, which is a veterans organization after World War II or after World War I, but certainly lasts well into the 50s, 60s, maybe even still going now, they become political and they, for instance, they start to support the Vietnam War and fight against Vietnam War opponents, things like that. So there has to be kind of a, a reason for these organizations to continue to, to keep going. And I think for the GAR, although I'm not an expert on this, I think for the GAR, there just wasn't any or it frittered away or, or whatever. 
sorry that that's 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 way off way off topic but let's go so let's move on to question five who is uh ben you're here now have i put you to sleep with all this gar talk ben no 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 you're good <laughs> um so uh this question uh it, it was pretty interesting to me to uh look at it um it, it was about the like dealing with monopolies and what was kind of the solution to dealing with that um i guess like he quoted or i guess declared um it's on page 419 he said in like 419 it said engineering news mm -hmm. um about i think it's about midway through uh, but essentially he he was saying how they're just trying to make money and by making money they decrease competition and without competition uh there's no need for i guess the development of better products Mm -hmm. is how he was explaining it and i think that was kind of the key issue that he was describing um really like just in general um ma ma just mainly because well, it's the whole like the, the competition if nothing new gets made then it's just going to be old and kind of become outdated and not like the best and that was what he was trying to i think express especially in the later half Mm -hmm. And uh, and then like even on page four twenty he was saying like a practice which tends to destroy competition or is unreasonable a practice is unreasonable which tends to destroy competition um, and he was just saying that like further on into that page how it like they do cutthroat competition espionage student business is fake independence making of exclusive contracts and like other methods uh, that's like all unfair trade that kind of goes against this. Um, and, I, and I believe that he wanted to more or less bring this to like the public's attention to understand what's going on because I believe at some point through it, he was saying how a lot of people aren't really aware of this going on. Mm -hmm. And it's very, uh, it, it is very important. And I think one of the key reasons he thought to, I, I guess one of his remedies would be just public knowledge of what's going on and definitely to try to increase competition more. So it's not just monopolies making the same thing, but it's mm -hmm. certain people keep getting it because it's the cheapest, but having somebody else who can compete with that or a few other companies that can to make something that may be a little more pricey, but overall better. And then people want to get that. And the old monopolies will be like, well, we got to upgrade now so that they can, they'll keep buying our stuff. But it, it not only would it take away some power from those monopolies, but it would help to, I guess, keep like society developing as well. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like the whole, one of the bigger points he made too, was just how society like stagnated or is like stagnating because it's, it can't develop because the monopolies are preventing it from doing that. And it's kind of like everybody's just going, going with the flow right now. But nobody knows any better to change that. Um, are you noticing this? This is a question for all of you. Are you noticing a similar theme in these in these kind of uh, these kind of um, speeches and 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 um, arguments and appeals to public opinion? This is a very what I'm trying to get at. It is a very there's a very strong progressive era underlying ethos here that I think we always always need to remember. I may be being too cryptic, but what I'm trying to say is 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 Brandeis is saying and and, and Roosevelt is saying and 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 uh, We, we as humans, and especially we as Americans, can fix our society and fix our culture and fix, you know, we are not just at the whim of nature or God or, or, or tradition, right? We can actively go in and do stuff that'll make a difference. Now, this, now this sounds 
obvious to people to to modern generations because you're sure everybody says this it's on every motivational poster in the entire world you know one person can make a difference every person and all that kind of stuff but that's not necessarily what what everybody thought at the in these earlier periods because there was a you know there were religious was god has a plan and it's working out and we're just supposed to follow it or you know, it's just the natural flow of things. This is tradition. Things progressives are very activists. We want to ins- insert ourselves into a problem in order to fix it. We can't just let uh, things gradually improve. And and I think we see a lot of that language here, and 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 in the and the Brandeis thing, and in the. Uh, uh, sorry, in the Brandeis thing and in the uh, um, Teddy Roosevelt thing, there's a lot of that. In fact, in fact, we're throwing. In fact, a lot of progressives sort of argue we're throwing away our American virtue by not doing this. You know, this is what makes America is this idea that you we can go in and we can change the landscape, we can change, we can change, we can change everything and improve everything. And that's what makes America, the newness of America and all that stuff makes it different from, from, from the traditional, the hidebound traditionalism of Europe. Uh, well, let's quickly go over these, these two essays before we want, uh, run out of time. I asked, I, I changed, I kind of changed up the, uh, the way the discussion agendas work and I asked, worked and I asked everybody to, to read these two essays. So is that what you did? If you didn't, I'll understand because it's a new thing and you've already earned your your discussion points in spades. Honestly, I didn't go to the bottom. I just read my name. I didn't realize that we were doing. Yeah, I, I, I so, figured that that might be the I'm way. Sorry, <laughs> I'll admit <laughs> I didn't realize until literally just now. Like, no, that that's okay. That's okay. I, I should I should have highlighted to people. Oh, we're doing going to do it slightly different. Sorry, if, I'm just no. being honest. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's great. I mean, you you, you four at the very least. Uh, very minimum are in the top rank, so I'm not worried about you. So anyway, so read these things and chime in on the discussion agenda, on the discussion board uh, when you can, and we'll move on to uh, all this other stuff uh, next week. Any other questions? I have to go to the bookstore to see if that book's in the next, the one that I don't have yet. Lynching and Spectacle? Um, I don't have one of them. I have Flanagan and I have the only other book that we haven't done is Lynching and Spectacle. Yeah, I have. I don't think I have him because I had that problem with the bookstore, but they did tell me a book was in. I just haven't got yet, gone yet because I keep forgetting. Yeah, okay. Because that's when I was having problems with like the bookstore and they like never got back to me. So I just like assumed it was gone. Like, it, like they just never got it. But if not, I mean, I can always order it on like Amazon. I'm pr- sure it's probably like not that expensive. Well, uh, if not, if you promise to uh, donate it to the campus library after you're done with it, I ha- I, th- I think I have that. I'm looking at my bookshelf over here. I think I have two. Okay. If you send me, if you, you, you email me your address, I can send it to you if the bookstore doesn't have it. Because correct me if I'm wrong about this. I need, need to know this for next semester. You pay a fee for books, right? Do you feel you pay a certain amount every so this, class? So what they do now is like this Barnes and Noble thing where you can either